This podcast is brought to you by ORCHSE Strategies, an industry leader in developing innovative, sustainable approaches for protecting workers and the environment. And a big thank you for their sponsorship to the Pre-Accident Podcast. ORCHSE's main focus and passion is in fostering EHS performance excellence in all their companies. When members participate in one or more of ORCHSE's nine different specialized networks, or if they engage in one of their task force or working groups, something very special happens. The sharing of ideas frequently results in cutting-edge solutions that have practical applications immediately. For example, ORC has been at the forefront of efforts to create new approaches for fatal and serious injury prevention and has helped plan, conduct, and create conferences on human and organizational performance. If you're interested in learning more about the unique opportunities available through ORCHSE, please contact our buddy Linda Haney at 202-510-0509. Or if you'd rather pop her an email, it's lynda.haney, L-I-N-D-A dot H-A-N-E-Y at O-R-C-H-S-E dot com. Now, let's listen to the podcast. Do you want me to be on your show first? You to be, uh, am I interviewing you or are we just going to do this all together? Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I'm your loving host, Todd Conklin. You're in for a treat today, but I say that most every podcast, so I must mean it this time or not. It's up to you to figure out. You have to determine if he's honest or not. Today is the Twin Podcast of Different Mothers episode. So Randy Cadeau, um, you know him from vspeed.com. Check it out on the web. Randy does a lot of crew resource management training and a lot of fundamentals of New view, high reliability, that kind of training. Randy has a podcast called Kicking Boxes, the Kicking Boxes podcast. And he asked if I would be on it, and I said I would love to because you want to help everybody out, right? And in the midst of uh, recording this podcast, he talked about the fact that maybe we should do a double. I could record his interview of me, which ended up being a total conversation, and that's what you're about to hear. So Randy and I are just going to sit around and talk about stuff that two people who have podcasts about high performance, high reliability, new view, would talk about. So sit back, relax, listen carefully. You're going to hear Kicking Boxes and the Pre-Accident Investigation Podcast happen simultaneously. It's like two podcasts in one. Is that not cool? Sit back. Here's Randy. Listen carefully. I've had actually he, he he runs a lessons learned company. That's his. He was a Marine Corps intelligence officer, and he started a lessons learned company years years later. And I thought, well, this isn't directly safety, but it ties so much into safety. Uh, to, uh, such an intertwined application. And oh, see, was, I would I would argue with you. I would argue a hundred percent that lessons learned is that's it. That is safety. I mean, that's completely. People it. would most people don't don't think that. They're like, what? Lessons learned. Well, then they're morons and wrong, and we hate them. <laughs> no, I mean, lessons learned. The, so the only, the best prevention tool you have for a fatality is learning. Right. I mean, that's a, and, and the problem, I mean, look at Hopkins' book, Failure to Learn. Absolutely. And, I mean, yeah. think, think about the fact that what, what the, to me, and I think about this all the time, so this lessons learned idea is really cool. Um the enemy of the question is the answer. And the biggest problem we have in, in safety, it's really in reliability. So operational excellence, safety, um, operational discipline, conduct of ops, all that kind of stuff. The biggest enemy we have is, is when we know the answer, we stop the analysis. And the minute we stop the analysis, what we fix are apparent cause or you know easy cause or attributed cause so we fix the wrong things, and then we expect different outcomes. And, and that's entirely a function of, of not learning. I mean, just, and, and smart, companies, smart companies are not terribly good at learning. I mean, it's really yeah, but, interesting to me. Yeah, I know. It, but doesn't it feel really good when you fix something? I mean, you have a problem. You know, a worker gets injured or there's a near miss, and, oh, we've got to hurry up and fix something. Because if you don't fix it, you may – you know, leave yourself open to having it happen again. 
But at the same time, if you fix it too quickly, you may fix the wrong thing, like you said, or just fix part of it. But doesn't it feel good? Don't we like to feel good and say we fix this and then we fix it across the organization? I think we'd like to drive uncertainty out. I, yeah. th- I think it has to do with existentialism. I don't know if it makes us f- – f- yeah, I guess it does make us feel good. But I think there's a high need around things like liability and potential lawsuits and lawyers and – senior leaders' expectations. There's a high need to say this problem won't happen again. Where I really find it interesting is in the belief that the same accident could ever happen twice. And and I think that's, that's um, seductive to us, is that we never want this to happen again. And yet if you, if you look at event context or you look at complexity, I mean complexity is really – the thing you want to look at, yeah. probably no event ever happens twice. I mean, you know, the only thing that makes a sprained ankle um, tallyable, accountable, is the ankle. Every sprained ankle event that's ever happened at any company anywhere is probably different than the one that happened before it and the one that happened after it. The only thing they have in common is the ankle. Handcuts, as, and I'm pretty convinced handcuts are entirely a function of material handling, Handcuts, although they all have hands, you know, it's it's not the hand that unifies them, although we want the hand to make it accountable and, and measurable, you know. It's it's the belief that events are – that were – so the thing that really freaks me out, Randy, is when I ask people, why do you do investigations? And they'll say, to stop repeat occurrences. And I want to just – when they say that, I want to just scream, ah, oh, st- oh, you're an idiot. The only reason, well, the only reason you, I don't, but the only reason you do investigations, the only reason you do investigations, in my mind, is to learn. Absolutely. And what you're going to learn, you have no idea until you actually go out and look, you you know, and, and I think when you look at Hopkins failure to learn, or when you look at big companies, BPs, companies like that, um, and you think, well, why are they not learning? Well, the answer is, is it's not that they don't have the time, energy, effort, resources, or, or emotional uh, maturity. They got all those things. It, the problem is is that they stopped so early in the process that learning stopped in order to, to turn into fixing. And so when you say, don't you feel good when you fix something? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I definitely feel good when when we look at a system and say, you know, there's a conflict here. There's bad lights on this uh, cherry picker. Let's buy the best lights we can buy. Let's buy the lights the guys need to do the work safely. That's satisfying for sure. Yeah, I think it is, and and, and not so much you, but I think the the human condition. It it feels good to a lot of people to say, "Oh, I've solved a problem. I helped somebody," even though there may be more lurking within the system that needs to be you know addressed, so learning can occur. I think um, I think what makes me what makes me feel good or what when I feel good about a company or when a company feels good about itself I'll get there eventually yeah is is when they don't punish put little quotes around that word punish when they don't punish somebody for for doing something they didn't intend to do right so in my mind when we're successful it's when we pull the heat off the worker or off the manager, because because the kind of the postmodern way to look at this is managers now are pretty good at not blaming the worker, but they're really bad at blaming themselves. So, oh yeah. So then then they'll say, you know, what did I do as a leader to mm-hmm. cause this event to happen? Well, the quick answer is, you know, probably there's a lot of answers to that, and collectively everybody did just enough to make this event take place. What we want to fix, though, is is the res- the the ability for the facility to have an event that's recoverable, that's manageable, it's resilient enough that it doesn't hurt anybody or blow up the plant. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I I was working with a client one time, and and there was a series of failures. Kind of, it, it was just just this perfect mix of complexity and cascading failures and ripple effects where. Some information wasn't passed properly. Some sh- systems were supposed to be shut down, but they weren't. So a pump continued to run, and there was some flooding. Nobody was hurt, but it, you know, it caused some damage. And, and this new supervisor says that was totally on me. And I said, no, it wasn't. You don't need to blame yourself for this. This is a system failure, and we can look into this. And uh, I just felt bad because he, you know, this guy tried to blame himself, and I thought it's not really your fault. And there's no. 
there's no value in just finding fault in, in what happened here. We, we need to examine it, but we need to learn and improve. And the crazy thing about that, and, and, and I think that was really good advice you gave, the crazy thing about that is I think that's how some people are interpreting the, the modern view, the, the new view of safety, is that we take now blame and move it up a level of abstraction and blame the organization. Or, or the word that's driving me crazy is culture. Because when they use the word safety culture to actually become a more elaborate way to blame people, Right, which you see all the time. I mean, that this one's all the time, but they they do it because they think it's an enlightened thing to say. Well, I'm not blaming workers. I'm blaming the culture. The culture's bad. Well, cultures <laughs> aren't bad or good. I mean, cultures are just cultures. You know, our cultures like air. Cultures right. just exist, and because cultures just exist, that that's what's happening is the cultures just sitting around there existing. Um, that sort of creates, uh, I don't know, I guess the best way to say it is kind of this elaborate device that says that people are bad and we need to fix them. To me, this whole conversation is really centering around two things. The big thing is that we have to, the new view, safety differently, really if you ask me, I think what safety differently is doing is changing the paradigm around how companies see their workers. Because for a really long time, we saw safety as something we did to the workforce, right? right? So we create safety for the worker. I don't want anyone to go home injured, that kind of stuff, zero accidents. What's shifting is that we're now seeing workers not as the problem, but workers really as the solution. The only way we're going to actually make this better, and we do have to make it better, the only way we're going to make it better is by actually changing that paradigm and um, and using workers as a resource. And that comes right back around to this ability to learn. We have to listen and analyze the people who do the work. We have to listen to them in order to understand how we can fix it. Yeah, one of the profound statements I remember from uh, was the ASSE PDC a couple years ago and Sidney Decker gave one of the keynotes and he, and I think this is from the third edition of the field guide. Um, but, and he referenced that I think on stage, but he said, workers finish the design. And then he went into this description about, um, uh, an aircraft cockpit and how they would put a, an upside down co- coffee cup on the flap handle. And I, I looked over to the guy next to me and I said, that's to remind them to check the position of the flaps. And sure enough, he went and finished the story, and, and sure enough, that's why they put a coffee cup on the flap handle because you know designers have their goals, managers have their goals, but we all can make mistakes. We can all make mer- errors. Even designers can introduce errors into a system, and they have great intentions, but it's, it's a, great, a great phrase, a great concept that the worker finishes the design. It goes back to what you said. We need to harness the the creativity of the worker because they're going to be the ones finding the problems with the system. If we don't listen to them on how to make the system better, more reliable, I mean, we're, that's a golden nugget of wisdom right there. We're missing a huge opportunity. Well, and I think you're right on talking. I mean, I really like what you're saying that the workers finished the design because any failure. Well, Sidney said that. I'm just quoting him. Oh, okay. But he's yeah. right. But, well, <laughs> but any, right. any failure is designed in the system. I mean, the, the thing about the system design is that when a system fails, it's just reached the limit of the design, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when I remember when we, when we transitioned from the, the legacy KC-130 Hercules to the J model, it was, it, I call it a supercomputer with wings on the outside. It looked the same as the old one, but on the inside, it was just flat panel displays, all these buttons. And, and I mean, literally we had this thing called the CNIMU and we would go out there for hours and practice, and we'd say, "All right, I'm working on my CNI Kung Fu," <laughs> uh. because it because it I mean it, it required so much effort and constant and diligence, and it's such an uncomfortable feeling to be, you know, screaming out of the sky in this tactical mission, and you're scratching your head saying, "What does that light mean?" <laughs> it's pretty uncomfortable. Oh yeah, I would think at a bunch so, of levels, right? Yes. Uh, that kind of uncertainty is you want to drive that out as fast as possible. Yeah, but like you said, the system is going to do what it's going to do. It's going to behave the way it's designed to do. And even good systems are limited, right? I mean, so every system – so you can look at it a couple ways. Every system is constantly moving towards failure, right? I mean, we know that's entropy. There's tons of science to back that up. 
But what you're really thinking is that every system is is running eroded. I mean, it's 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 eroding, right? A system is becoming less stable as a system progresses, and that when failure happens, that failure's in the system. You know, the designers didn't put it there. I'm not saying that there's malice on the part of the designers, but what happens is the system has reached its its limit. It's that's that's as much as we thought would, would happen. So you look at a. You know, I've been looking at a bunch of fatalities lately. I've looked at like. Oh, I don't even know. Fourteen, maybe maybe a, a, so maybe like eleven, eleven fatalities in the last uh, sixty days. Mm-hmm. So that's a lot, right? And in and when, different industries, yeah, so yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when you look at those fatalities, you can't not compare because you're looking at uh, you know almost a dozen of them in sixty days, and you start to realize that there's really only three reasons people will die. I'm not sure I'm 100% settled on this thinking yet, but it's a pretty bold thing to say there's only three reasons. But it seems like there's either a lack of controls, systems, safeguards. You know, they, they, they reach the end of, of the protections that existed in the system. Or there's a loss of control yeah. that somehow the safeguards they put in the system failed to function, didn't function, weren't sufficient enough, um, weren't engaged correctly, you know, wore out, eroded, whatever. Or the third one really is is this kind of failure to learn thing that we we started our discussion on that that the the company didn't have the ability to imagine the failure that they had was possible. So they either weren't pulsing their system and looking for weak signals, they weren't Understanding their margins, as Pup would say. Oh, I think we're supposed to call him Ivan now. He's got a really important job. Ivan, uh, okay. Ivan would say, right? There's yeah. there those three reasons. Well, when you start to think about that, then you start to really start. Uh, you start realizing that what we really do is not prevent events. What we really do is control consequence and create systems that can fail as safely as possible. Because failure is really normal because nobody can imagine the limits of the system. And I love the idea that you said to me that Sydney said to you, which is that workers <laughs> com- complete the design. I mean, that's 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 really a good way to look at it. I think so too. And I, lo- I love the discussion of margins. And especially when it comes to, to the, the idea of drift and uh, – you know, we think about operational drift, performance variability. It's really a normal part of work, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not I mean, even it's not even terribly interesting. Actually, the drift between work is imagined and work is done is super normal. I, I've become way less enamored with that. I'm much more interested in the margins um, that exist around work is actually being done because those margins, I think, are very. That's what that's what workers actually. So when you fly a, those big planes, you fly. What you really manage is the margin. You manage the the envelope of safe operations, and you keep that margin to your comfort level, uh, probably as much as you possibly can. You can tell me if I'm wrong because I don't fly those. But no, no, that's 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 exactly right. And right? And, and, and when you're freaked out or super attentive or super engaged, or super mindful, right? All words that we use depending on which meeting you go to, um, right. right? That's that's because the margin is so small that you're having to actually manage the rest of the design, right? If we use Sydney's idea, as a single point, as, as an operator. And so when you start thinking about it that way, then it really changes how you look at safety. I mean, yeah, uh, be- behavior is really unimportant as a corrective action, but super important as a uh, as a safeguard. So uh, it's, absolutely. It's very interesting. Yeah. And there's just there's certain limits that, in my, in my opinion, I mean, this kind of goes back to, you know, the 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 old philosophy in the Marine Corps still is this way. But the Marine, the human is is the most important part of the system. So the system itself has to be designed to maximize human potential but also um and i think i listened to your your episode with david woods today but the creation of safety i love that idea because when you are managing those margins it is the team within that system with within the technology that's on the edge that's trying to manage those margins and and just to 
as an example, like you mentioned flying a big airplane, but when you're flying this big hunk of metal at 300 feet over the ground, which for a big airplane doing these defensive tactics, it's not very high. Oh, yeah. I mean, it sounds like it. I mean, 300 feet. Wow. But you know, you can sneeze and, and lose 10% of your altitude. So you're just hyper vigilant and in the whole crew and the flight deck, it's, you could hear a pin drop. They're so quiet and hyper aware because like you mentioned, that margin is, is so narrow at that point. And then when you get altitude, you can almost feel the, the air go back into your lungs. And, and it's because that margin is there. See, and I think that, to me, that's the most, that's the most interesting because the, the, and the, it's really the cool operator and is the operator is the most important part of the process while simultaneously the least reliable system, right, yeah. part of that system. And yeah. so you've got this really interesting um, – kind of yin and yang. I don't know. I'm trying to think of non bimodal terms. You've got this really interesting, um, relationship between, um, completing the design and being non reliable that I think we're constantly managing. And it's fun. I mean, it's, it's I, what I think is fun about this whole deal is that it's starting to have legs. I mean, people are really looking at system design differently um and that's really sad that's satisfying you know listening to these computer guys talk about you know moving from one mainframe that is highly defended to thousands of smaller computers where they have the capacity to fail but when they fail they lose a hundredth of a percent of their capability um and so they manage lots of small systems in order to create long-term overall success or to stop catastrophic failure. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I, I think you're referencing the DevOps piece and you're, you're yeah. Adrian which, Cockroft. Yeah. Which I know Very nothing cool. about, nothing at all, except that the more I hear them talk and the more they listen to us talk, the more we realize that we, we all are kind of doing the same thing, right? I mean, we're all, we're all creating systems where the potential of, failure is possible but the consequence of failure is actually minimal yeah yeah because you have the 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 whole idea of micro failures and one of the things i really liked in that episode was when he talked about um i I use the term headbutting i can't remember what he said but he said you know the the engineers think this they think that um or the ops guys think the developers are, are handing us these products and the the dev guys think the ops are breaking the products or something like that and it just reminded me of the classic headbutting between operations and maintenance, the maintainers think the operators are breaking the airplanes or, or breaking the drills or the tools or whatever, and vice versa. The operators think that the maintainers are too slow and getting the equipment back. And I think with the whole DevOps idea, you've combined this uh, – I don't love this term, but situational awareness you know, or a mindfulness of both sides of the job so they can work together for a common goal. And that's pretty cool to me. Yeah, isn't that cool? And then that stuff, I think, is super satisfying. That that is that's the most exciting part of the work we do. Is, yeah, is, and and the, and so that and does that keep people from getting hurt? Yep, probably. Does it save jobs? Yep, probably. I mean, it probably meets all the tests. Does it fix problems? Yep, probably. So it meets all the tests that we normally look at. But the, that I think is that's really a sort of a that's really a nice way to look at it yeah i agree let me let me ask you this you let's talk about this for a second you mentioned like the unreliable human or the non-reliable human and i would imagine so i i wouldn't ever phrase it that way i would always say that humans are stunningly stunningly reliable until they're not Right. And so yeah. one of the balances I think we have to make is that the, the, the operator, the worker is the most important safety feature in a system. Absolutely. While simultaneously the, the least mechanically reliable, the, the, it, but yeah. it's, it's really a hard call because everything kind of dog whistles out to be, you know, if we just made the worker, you know, I just had this huge argument. I was trapped in a plane yesterday for four hours, which was hideous. Um, but I'm <laughs> was the air conditioning on um, for a while? It was really a drag. It, it was a weather thing, so it was you couldn't really even complain about it. But I was having this big text battle with this person over <laughs> over error, over human error, 
And my premise is, and this is, you know, I've grown to this, is that yeah. a, a human error is just not, it's not very important. And it's, and it's, it's incredibly predictable and it's, and it's not a choice. So you can't, you can't really do things to reduce error because if you think you're going to reduce error, what you're, what you're assuming is that error is a choice. So I can't, I can't really, I can't, I can make systems that understand the error is there. So the big argument we're having over, and this is all in text, was when you call Papa John's Pizza, the guy on the other end of the phone uses three-way communication to confirm that you are getting the pizza you've ordered. So he and, must have read, read the Human Performance Handbook. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. But that's right. what they were saying. And, then, and yeah. they said that's an error prevention tool. And I said, I no, it, it tool, doesn't prevent a, the error. Yeah, it's it's an operational discipline. It's a really good idea, especially if your profit margins are low and mistakes could eat into the pennies you make making pizzas. It's a great idea, but it doesn't prevent error because I could still order the wrong pizza and have it confirmed. And and that's to me, that's really that's a huge part of of our field that there's kind of a, a schism. There's a, there's a difference because we still have people that want to go into kind of error management and they want to error proof things. They want to make things so workers don't make errors, except that I would suggest the other side of that schism says, well, n- nobody chooses to make errors. So training them to not make errors doesn't really mean they won't make errors what we want to do is sort of reinforce systems so that when errors happen, they're either detectable really quickly, three-way communication on a pizza order, right? And and we can detect it almost immediately, right? But that doesn't stop the error. In fact, that has nothing to do with the error. That's, a, that's an operational discipline. It's a de- detection tool. Or we yeah. want to make systems where the error, when it happens, has virtually zero consequence. Elevators are a great example. You can push the wrong button in an elevator and you don't die. You just go to the wrong floor. Right. Right? It's an annoyance, but that's about it. But, but it's, it's – so you make the mistake. The mistake's there. It just has very, very little consequence. Uh, that, that, I think, is a – that it's a big deal right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, because there I are love, still people that are desperately holding on. And I have theories that I should tell you not on your podcast, but I have theories about why they're desperately holding on to those things. But I think they hold on to them because they believe, well, I'm not going to say, because I'll tell you later when we're not being recorded, okay. but, but they're, <laughs> ho- they're holding on to these old ideas. And I actually think it's, it's sending the wrong message. It's just kind of a more elaborate way of saying we can fix the worker. We can fix the worker. Yeah. When in fact, what I what I want is the worker to tell me these are mistakes that happen, and when they happen, here's how we check them, here's how we detect them, and here's how we fix them. Right. I, I like the whole idea. I, I call it error detection and correction. And you can't always correct, but you know you can you can detect it, you can trap what you can, you can mitigate what you can, but try to move on, try to try to preserve the safety and operational capacity. But what what I this is a great thread to me because what frustrates me. Is when you know we we find uh, an example of human error, like you said, it's really not that interesting. It's just a natural consequence of of the way work is performed. It's not a choice. Yet, yet we companies or industries try to drive out this error by retraining, by fixing the human, by giving them another example. And I think, all right, let's talk about this. And is there some small tweak or change you can make to the technology, to the operational procedures, the work methods, the environment? To make it less likely that they're going to do that. And a lot of times it's like I'm just kind of looked at with blank stares. I'm like, why don't uh, – you said it best I think at one point. Make the job harder for the worker to do wrong. I think yeah. that's the way you said it. I yeah. love that. But, but you think about it. And systems, it, it should be really easy to do it right. Hey, buddy, this was awesome. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. No it's been a man. pleasure as always. Um, so until next time, I guess we're good. What do you think? How'd you think it went? I liked it. I liked it. So that's Randy Cadell and Todd Conklin, the Kicking Boxes Pre-Accident Podcast. Can you tell I'm in a really noisy room recording this for you guys? (laughs) That's how this works. I hope you enjoyed it. 
it's kind of fun. It was really just more of a conversation about stuff that I guess we're both interested in. We talked about a ton of stuff, um, but it, it went well. I mean, I thought it was really a fun way to spend time. And Randy's got so much going on. If you guys have a need, so I'm going to tell you that planning and crew resource management buys you capacity. The reason you want to even focus on CRM, the reason airlines or, or vessels do bridge resource management is to buy capacity when the margins get small. And so what Randy really offers is a pretty aggressive course in creating capacity, creating crew resource management discipline and operational discipline. It's a great little thing to do. Look into it. It's worth looking into. Until then, though, that's the podcast for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a great time. Tell your friends the numbers are getting crazy big. Um, subscribe because that makes a huge difference. Any way you can do it, get people to listen to some of these podcasts. It really helps change their mind. I get so much feedback from you guys, and it's always so much fun to hear you talk about it. Thanks for everything. The new book is doing great. Um, thanks for asking about that, too. Pre-accident investigation, better questions. You can get it where all good books are sold and also where crappy books are sold. You have to determine if it's good or crappy. Um, um, if you've not read it, it's worth picking up for the case studies alone. Um, but it's a good read, indeed, indeed, indeed. Until then, thanks for your time on the podcast. Learn something new every single day, will you? Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>